So we left off with this depiction. And I was arguing to you that um, energy surplus, energy deficit are related to um, obesity and perhaps diabetes. The physiology section will hopefully put the nail in the coffin and connect those two for us. But uh, this is a look at how we can approximate the expenditure side of exercise or even of rest. Measuring oxygen will allow us to um, calculate or approximate energy expenditure of a given activity. So this can be structured exercise, it could just be sitting at rest, we have lead in and then recovery values that are just resting energy expenditure, um, and then whatever the activity is, is uh, highlighted by this increase in VO2. So if we see an increase in oxygen consumption, generally that parallels an increase in energy expenditure, and we can calculate that by picking a few different points along the way. I'm trying to calculate the area under the curve. So this is only nine minutes of exercise. It's not very long. It could be an hour. It could be an hour and a half. If we have representative points and this level doesn't change very much, if it's pretty consistent, then we can calculate the energy expended as the area under the curve. It looks like if you average those three points, this person was at about 1.1 liters per minute over nine minutes. Remember, if we can calculate the oxygen, we can calculate the energy. So that's about 10 liters or about 50 kcals if we take our 5 kcals per liter rule of thumb. The actual, I sat down and I tried to figure out what height each of these red dots were at. The actual is 20.3 liters in nine minutes. Oh, with 30 second bins, so 10.15 liters per nine minutes, 50.75 kcals. The numbers don't mean a whole lot. We're going to go through examples. But the approximation is close to the actual calculated value. That's one of what I want to get across. It is more accurate, though. And the smaller the slice is, the more accurate our, our depiction or our estimate of the energy expended. So, for example, we always have this lead-in phase to steady state, and then there's adjustments on the bike, there's speeding up the RPMs or adjusting yourself as you're running on the treadmill. There's some variation in steady state. And at the largest, biggest picture level, we can take one average value for the duration of exercise and calculate energy expenditure accordingly, the shaded area. One step towards being more detailed would be, instead of taking one average value, let's take two. The average in the first half is slightly lower than the average in the second half because of this large lead-in phase. And so the shaded area of these two squares would give us a slightly more detailed um, estimate of the energy expended. And so you can see where I'm going with this. If you can get finer and finer slices, you get a much more comprehensive picture. And I won't tell you that this is just like doing an integral in calculus, because that'll turn all of you off right away. But all I'm going to do now is just break down these into smaller and smaller bins. Maybe these are 20 second bins, maybe they're 5 second bins, I don't know. But if I can figure out the average uh, rate of oxygen consumption in each of these smaller bins, and then I add all those up, I get a much, um, the, the, the picture, the, the fidelity of the, the, the boxes to this line is a lot tighter. I get a much better representation of the area under the curve. If you have one second bins, the most accurate method of estimating, but we're not going to go that far. All we want is to be able to calculate oxygen consumed and then approximate the energy expended. And if we stop there, if we assume one liter of oxygen is 5 kcals, we're doing pretty well. But we're not going to stop there. We're going to get more detailed. This is a pretty good approximation. Does anyone have trouble with the idea that calculating the area under the curve gives me an absolute volume of oxygen, liters of oxygen? <laughs> 
I want to make sure that's clear before we move ahead. The area under the curve. The area of, a, of a, a square. Height times width. Liters per minute times minute. Minutes cancel out. You're left with liters. Okay. So if we can calculate the volume of oxygen, we can calculate the energy expended. We get a lot more information as well from some other respiratory variables on the mix of fuels used to accomplish that exercise. So when we look at a table like this, we get two more detailed pieces of information. We get the actual caloric cost of that exercise, and we get a representation of the mix of substrates. And this should, I think, be review from ex-phys. We're applying it here now to a clinical population. <coughs> so far, 5 kcals per liter has just been a number that I threw at you. But that number is not static. That number changes. It changes depending on whether you're relying more on fat or on carbohydrate to do the exercise. And that number is called a caloric equivalent. It's shown by this second column here. This is the caloric equivalent of each liter of oxygen for varying uh, respiratory exchange ratios. I'll talk about that in a second. You can see it's not 5. It's close to 5. In some cases, it's above 5. We get more than 5 kilocalories for every liter of oxygen when our RER is high. But we get less if it's very low. So we can ballpark the energy expended using 5. It's a nice round number, but when we want a detailed um, assessment of the energetic cost of exercise, we use a table like this. <coughs> and I'll go through an example coming up. So if we used exclusively carbohydrate, our RER was 1, we uh, harvest, we get 5.047 kcals per liter of O2. Carbohydrate is our high-octane fuel, gives a lot of energy. Whereas if we're using all fat oxidation, we only get 4.686 kcals per liter of O2. It's less efficient. You get less energy for the same oxygen consumption. And then anything in between, there's graded values in between. It is rare that you will ever see anyone on those ends. It's rare anyone will only ever use carbohydrate or only ever use fat to accomplish exercise. If you see one extreme, you're probably uh, likely to see a high RER during a VO2 max test, for instance. But those numbers are skewed. And you probably remember that it's skewed from the production of what we call non-metabolic CO2. We've talked about it in class already when we talked about the uh, regulation of ventilation. CO2 that's released from the muscles can be converted to, um, to uh, or sorry, acid that's released in the muscles can be buffered and converted to CO2, so more of it appears at the lung. We have a higher RER value than simply one. It's what we call non-metabolic CO2, even though it's sort of a misnomer. It's still metabolism but it's not in the metabolism of foodstuffs that that CO2 is produced. So it's unlikely you'll see anyone at the extremes. It's more likely you'll see a range. And even the RER, the mix, will change as exercise progresses. It's likely you'll see someone in the middle of this range. And of course, we can manipulate that with intensity. It might just creep up with duration but we can record it and then do our calculations accordingly. So let's look at an example calculation then in full detailed form for how I would like you to apply these numbers. Let's take one scenario. This scenario is an individual exercising for one hour at an average of 1.5 liters per minute. That's their VO2 over the course of the hour. In the RER, we've recorded a 0.86. So this is even not the most detailed representation. We have one average uh, value that we're going to apply to the entire 60 minutes. But we're looking at how we can apply RER in this case. 
if we didn't consider RER, we have 90 liters of O2 times 5 kcals would be 450 kcals, if we just ballparked the caloric equivalent at 5. So keep that number in mind, and we'll compare it at the end. The first thing that I'd want to do is figure out, okay, what amount of oxygen was consumed? I have a rate, I have a duration. If I combine those two things, I get 90 liters of oxygen. Well, I know if I can calculate oxygen consumed, I can approximate energy expended, um, but I need to know the caloric equivalent first. An RER of 0 0.6 indicates some mix of fuels is being used to satisfy that exercise. An RER of 0 0.86, if I just look at the table, means for every liter of oxygen of those 90 liters, my yield is 4.875 kcals per liter. And there are other numbers over here which we'll look at later, but right now I'm only focused on the caloric equivalent, 4.875. It's not 5, so I'm going to calculate this number directly as we'll round to 439, 440 kcals. So if I compare that to my ballpark estimate, my ballpark estimate was pretty close. It's off by 10 kcals. Over the course of an hour, that's nothing. That's a rounding error. So we can still get a pretty good estimate using our 5 kcal per liter general rule, but when we want a more accurate depiction and a breakdown of carbohydrates and fat, we use numbers like this. I would probably prefer you to give me a calculation or results like this on a final exam, for instance, not just ballpark 5 kcals per liter. So an exam would be given this table? Or? Absolutely, you would be given the table. You would not be required to memorize that 0 0.75 is 4.739 kcals per liter. Good point, yes. Just like I gave you the hexaxial reference system, I don't, I don't expect you to have to memorize this. It's using this tool that I, I want you to know. So let's look at the other information in this table. It's, it's pretty useful information. And again, it's all dependent on the respiratory exchange ratio. We have this amount of energy being consumed, but what proportion is from fat, what's from carbohydrate. If we're at a, uh, an RER of 0.86, 54-ish percent is coming from carbohydrate, 46-ish percent is coming from fat. So we can calculate the, the caloric contribution from each of those two macronutrients, and then knowing our standard um, kcal per gram numbers that I presented earlier, we can actually calculate the gram amounts of carbohydrates and fat that are being used. If you want to come full circle, you can then think of, well, that exercise, how many Big Macs is that, or how many chocolate bars, which is what I do. That's why I exercise, to figure out how many, how many pizzas I can eat that day. So, at this RER, 54.1% of the, the total energy expended is from carbohydrates. So, simply 54.1% of around 440 gives me 237.36 kcals of carbohydrate. The uh, complementary calculation for fat is 201.39 kcals of fat, and I can divide um, this first number by 4, the second number by either 7 or 9, depending on um, your interpretation of the fat guidelines to figure out the gram amounts. If, uh, if we use 7 kcals per gram, that's only 30-ish grams, 29 grams of fat which kind of puts it into perspective. A lot of people will exercise to change body composition and lose weight. An hour at a low to moderate intensity results in um, a loss of only 30 grams of fat. And if you consider grams versus kilograms <coughs> on the scale, you can appreciate how and why the process is incremental, right? Changes to body composition and health don't happen at the drop of a hat. 
the accrual of these deficits over time is how body composition can be affected. So we have some more detail about the macronutrient mix and the overall energy expended. What we're really focused on right now is the energy expended um, in the context of energy balance. But we have a little bit more detail here. Now one thing that might not be sitting too well with you is the fact that we always take time to get the steady state. And you might know this uh, as a concept called O2 debt. Uh, it's complemented by what we used to call O2 deficit, but now better referred to as EPOC or the excess post-exercise oxygen consumption. These are situations where aerobic metabolism does not match the demand. That's essentially what they are. So for O2 debt, <coughs> the demand is high and aerobic metabolism cannot yet satisfy the demand. Whenever you start to exercise at an endurance type moderate intensity, you don't gradually, I was going to say you don't gradually increase the workload, but maybe you do. Maybe that's part of the program. Maybe that's the warm-up phase. If you got on a bike at one workload, it doesn't automatically adjust to match the aerobic metabolism in, uh, in the muscle. It's always there. You're doing that work even if you're unable to satisfy it aerobically. So the deficit, or sorry, the debt, the missing energy has to come from somewhere. And you remember where that energy comes from. Anyone want to posit a guess? ATP, PCR, or glycolysis? Fantastic. Non-aerobic um, metabolism. Substrate level phosphorylation, which is glycolysis, or buffered by phosphocreatine breakdown. Absolutely. So this is not technically, not technically part of exercise, but it's, it's not part of the aerobic cost of exercise. The classical interpretation was this was not part of the exercise itself, and it was balanced by excess post-exercise oxygen consumption on the tail end. Um, so energy comes from other sources. Classically, we don't think of this as part of the cost of exercise, but it's really just not part of the cost or the aerobic cost of exercise. It's still work that is done. Energy was expended to accomplish this work. We just can't record it. We can approximate it, but we can't record it. So this is balanced by EPOC in the recovery phase, where again, aerobic metabolism is not matching the demand. The demand is largely reduced when exercise is done. Yet for some reason, oxygen consumption stays elevated. For the longest time, I know a lot of, uh, of papers tried to match, compare, and predict or equate the two thinking that this is simply repayment of the energy that was borrowed at the onset of exercise. It's not a perfect reflection of O2 debt, however. Some people have even gone so far as to say, okay, well, EPOC in the first six minutes of recovery is a good representation of O2 debt, and if we record that, then we get a good sense of what the cost the missing cost was at the onset of exercise. But it's not. There's no clear way to equate EPOC with O2 debt, and the reason is that this is much larger than O2 debt. The processes that are supported by EPOC and recovery are those that go to correct the disturbance of exercise. So sodium potassium ATPase, calcium ATPase, resynthesizing glycogen that was used during the exercise, activating the vasculature to divert blood flow, activation of the ventilatory muscles to catch your breath. All those things need energy. And it's not simply reflective of the initial small disturbance um, 
caused by the, the O2 debt portion at the onset of exercise. This is, for our purposes, not part of the aerobic cost of exercise, but part of the total cost of exercise. Because you can't ever divorce, well really you can't divorce O2 debt or EPOC from the fact that you engaged in exercise. So when we calculate the area under the curve, it might seem incorrect to include this or to include recovery, but that was still energy that was expended to accomplish that goal. It's still energy that was expended and tips the scales of balance in favor of expenditure. So I'm going to say that it's still something we should calculate in order to um, assess energy deficit or energy balance. And so to articulate that contrast, I'll show you back uh, with our initial example. We have some resting energy expenditure that's always occurring. It's just constitutive to support our normal life processes. And in a pure sense, if we want to measure the cost of exercise, the aerobic cost of exercise, we want to get a clear estimate of this area under the curve. And even the parallelogram that I've drawn is not the, the best. It's a pretty good representation. But the aerobic cost of exercise is reflected by this greenish-blue shaded area. This is a pure applied science point of view, but for individuals in the field, from a clinical point of view, trying to prescribe exercise to affect energy balance, really the total cost of exercise is a better indicator or a better um, calculation to make, which includes both EPOC or recovery. Here on the right-hand side, it's only a short-lived recovery uh, elevation in VO2. And the O2 debt on the left-hand side as well. This was still exercise that was accomplished. It was performed. It needed energy from somewhere. We can't directly measure it because O2 consumption is not supporting this energy, but we can approximate it if the uh, workload doesn't change over time. So this combined area, the, the purple and the green-blue areas, are what we would want to maximize or increase to augment energy expenditure, to create an energy deficit. We can't do much about the resting energy expenditure that's generally fixed, although with training this can increase or decrease depending on if you accrue muscle mass or not, but we can directly influence the sum total of exercise shown here. So what does it look like if we affect exercise? The example that we just looked at is probably best represented by this top figure. It's a light type of exercise. Small uh, excess post-exercise oxygen consumption and recovery. And if we increase the intensity of exercise, there's a proportional increase in the energy expended. That sort of is logical. If you do more work, the energetic cost goes up. In this example, we don't have specific durations, but let's say these are of the same duration. The only difference is the intensity. Light versus heavy. As we increase the intensity, not only do we increase the, the deficit, but we also increase epoch and recovery. In some cases, if the increase is large enough, if heavy exercise is above what VO2 can sustain, this deficit might pour over um, what we're able to do aerobically. It's really only for those crazy individuals that like to do sprint type exercise though. You won't see that with, with clinical populations too often. But what I want to um, reflect with this comparison is if we're considering the total cost of exercise, 
on the top shown with this blue green shaded area and it's not perfect but it's it's pretty good light exercise compared to heavy exercise on the bottom now sort of an orangey yellow shaded area if I just directly overlay these two I want the largest area possible to induce the largest deficit or the largest expenditure here I'm doing that by increasing intensity and if we saw a perhaps more realistic trace Maybe it's realistic, maybe it's a cartoon drawing. The same exact thing would be borne out here where I have some lighter, moderate VO2 compared to a heavier or more intense, higher VO2. Over the same duration, the relative contributions, the total cost of exercise, fairly different. So increasing the intensity one significant way that we can increase the cost of exercise. What's the other? Increasing duration. Increasing duration. Absolutely. So I didn't show that here, but if I <coughs> took um, two of these traces on the same average VO2 level, but one of them was longer and span over, over to the door perhaps, the area under the curve would still be larger, the expenditure would be greater. The complication that we have with accurately calculating energy expended in this O2 debt phase is reflected by attempts to calculate the expenditure of high intensity interval type training. So this is sort of a thought experiment. How would you ever try to approximate the energy expended during HIT training? What would it look like? You assume that between the peaks that you'd have excess post-exercise oxygen. Okay. So then you can kind of like fill the gap. Okay, I see what you're saying. So, so Dylan's expecting that between these peaks, we have three peaks here, VO2 might stay somewhat elevated or connect the peaks and you want to take the values at the peak and use that as our average value over time and then just calculate the area underneath. That wouldn't be a bad approximation. What I'm showing you directly here is a decrease between the, uh, between the peaks. So maybe there's a bit more time to allow VO2 to drop off. You'll notice it does kind of creep up over time. It doesn't ever fully recover. Generally, it doesn't stay as elevated as you want to use the average of all the peaks. <coughs> Usually, let's say the exercise is shown here. The exercises are, are the grayed out areas. When you start exercise, VO2 responds, all of metabolism responds. We eventually reach some peak and this happens to coincide with exercise. And then there's a gradual dropping off in recovery between the two bouts. Depending on the time, you'll either completely recover or maybe you won't completely recover. But it generally doesn't stay elevated. What you would have to do is a calculation like this which is not very user-friendly. It's very difficult to calculate the energy expended during interval training. It's hard to, um, to approximate the recovery portion of each of these sprints unless you're measuring continuously. So this example is one where I happen to have measured for three sprints continuously, VO2 is shown here for three sprints. If I have that data, I can do this calculation without too much difficulty. If there are 20 sprints, just doing this calculation times just under seven is not gonna be a very nice uh, estimate as these change over time. So really what I want, it, want you to take away from this is that our attempts to calculate energy expenditure are really only applicable to steady state type exercise. It's very difficult to do this for high intensity interval training type exercise. Perhaps it's a bit easier to illustrate too, if we think um, of trying to calculate the mix of fat and carbohydrates during this type of training as well. The first thing we need would be an RER value. And that would allow us to calculate the mix of fat and carbs. Well, that's also 
equally not possible or equally difficult. RER will often be above 1 if this is really intense. In recovery from exercise, VO2 drops quickly. VCO2 does not, so RER spikes in recovery. And it's not reflective of the mix of macronutrients. So similarly, we can't get a good idea of the mix of fat and carbs that are used to satisfy this type of exercise. So I'm not going to ask you to ever try to approximate HIIT training or the energetic cost of HIIT training. You can really only apply this to um, endurance type activity. Would the, the net curve be able to calculate three on the curve? Is the technology there that it can figure it out as we go? Would the Metcart calculate area under the curve? Yes, um, but it needs to have special canopy, the, the, what we call it, the attachment that we call is a, a canopy attachment that connects, it's like a mask that fits over your head and collects everything and um, is used for sensitive measures of resting metabolic rate or uh, basal metabolic rate. And it can calculate your expected daily RMR from a continuous collection like this. But it's going to be subject to the same calculation errors that we are, where it's not going to be able to use RER because it's not affected uh, or it's not only dependent on the mix of uh, substrates to do this exercise. But it might have to do a better job of um, estimating the total energy expenditure if it has a continuous line like this. I haven't used the MetCart to do that because generally the principles say it's not possible. Um, it would be an interesting thing to explore. Maybe in a future lab when we get away from the walk versus run. The walk versus run is almost like endurance versus sprint comparison, except you're not sprinting for the, uh, the kilometer. You're simply comparing the, uh, the low drawn out duration of walking versus the higher, more accentuated, faster um, cost of running. If we manipulate only one of these variables, it's pretty obvious how exercise is affected, or the cost of exercise is affected. Increase intensity, cost goes up. Increase duration, cost goes up. But you don't often only change one value, especially for an untrained individual. Case in point, I'm not a runner. I dislike running because I think that I go too slow when I run, so I try to run faster. And then the thing that happens is I get tired, I realize I'm not that fit, and then I fatigue, I stop, so I'm not moving at all. So the trade-off occurs that as I increase intensity, duration shortens greatly. So I wonder which one of these is best at enhancing the energetic cost of exercise. For an untrained individual like myself, if I want to affect body composition and lose weight, should I run or walk a kilometer? If I run a kilometer, I'm going, say, twice as fast. I might expect to take half the time. Which one of these is greater? And there's no answer yet. It's a hypothetical question for now, but you're hopefully going to determine in lab which one of these is greater. Anyone have a guess? Walking, Walking is greater? Your RQ would be lower? Well, there's two ideas there. Let's talk about those two different ideas. One, the idea of energy expenditure being lesser or greater, won't rely on RQ or won't rely on RER. But if our idea is that of which one uses more fat, I could see the argument that if your RQ is lower, you have a greater percentage of fat being used to accomplish the exercise, maybe over the course of this longer duration, um, the use of fat is greater. I want you to actually calculate that when you get to lab. That would be an interesting uh, thing to find out. But energy doesn't rely on RQ, so all we want is the area under the curve. Do you think if I ran twice as fast for half as long, the expenditure would be the same? Would it be less than? 
would be equal to. In theory, you'd think yeah. it'd be the same. It might be easier to picture, let's say I'm walking, and then I'm speed walking. So I'm walking at one pace, and then I walk twice as fast for half the time. In that situation, I would entertain the argument that they should be identical. Really, the catch is that we've switched to running. And I'm going to Tarantino the lab for you and show you the, uh, the end of it. I'm going to show you what you should find out in lab. I've left this before and let you go through the labs or let previous classes go through the labs. And it didn't quite work out as planned and their expectations didn't match the reality. So I want to show you what should happen in lab. This has actually been studied uh, at length by a group in Syracuse. And their goals in this study are to compare running versus walking like you're doing in lab. They want to compare treadmill versus track, which is... I guess maybe passive versus active running. You could think about it that way. And then there's a whole third element, which is comparing actual observed energy expenditure to predictive equations. So the ACSM and CSEP have equations that say if you're running this quickly on this grade, you should use about this much energy. We're not going to look at those. We're only looking at the cost of running versus walking. First thing I want you to notice, absolutely no difference between treadmill versus track or men versus women. So men in closed bars, women in uh, hatch bars, these are the same height. They're not statistically significant. The groups are the same. Men versus women, similar expenditure. Track versus treadmill, similar expenditure. So running on a treadmill, running on the track, You'd think active versus passive. The treadmill's propelling you, but no difference in expenditure. And similarly, running, or sorry, walking, no difference in expenditure. So treadmill versus track, they both cost the same. It doesn't matter where you run or walk. They both cost the same. One piece of information that is missing from this description, is it in there? No. Same distance. Running is t uh, twice as fast as walking, and it's the same speed that you're going to use in lab, 10 kilometers an hour versus 5 kilometers an hour. So running is twice as quick. It should be half the time, but expenditure is much greater when running versus walking. This is what I hope you observe in lab. Running twice as fast for half the time, even though you complete the same distance, costs more, creates a larger expenditure, therefore it creates a larger deficit, might be a better therapy for obesity, diabetes, weight control. All right, we want to maximize energy expended. If this is the same work, why does running cost more? Same distance, twice as fast, half the time. Why does running cost more? Different muscles consuming more oxygen. Different muscles consuming more oxygen. Okay, so, so I agree, absolutely, consuming more oxygen, but they don't do it for as long. So the total should theoretically be the same. But tell me more about this different muscles idea, because <laughs> you're, you're very close. I'm just thinking like when you do like bike versus treadmill, you get to the max and somehow it's okay. usually lower because you're not using as many muscles, like your arms and core and stuff aren't as engaged, so like something along those lines. Fantastic. Okay, so so Hannah's using the idea of non-weight bearing versus weight bearing exercise. And there are other supporting muscles that are involved with running versus cycling, and maybe the same idea is true yeah. for running versus walking. I'd agree with that. You want to add to that? Um, running would be less, less efficient because there's more energy moving you upwards. upwards. Excellent. You're not only propelling yourself forward, you're also propelling yourself upwards, which is not necessarily forward motion. So you are fighting gravity a lot more when you're running versus walking. And if you're exercising at higher intensities, you'd be using more carbohydrate, which is a more efficient substrate to be using than fat. So would that also potentially decrease 
not decrease, but just skew the... Uh, Interesting. Okay, that's, that's a good idea. So if you're at a higher intensity and you switch to a more, more um, high energy fuel, you would get more energy out of every liter of O2 consumed. Would that contribute to the difference in energy expended? I can see why you would think that, but the operative factor is not the amount of oxygen consumed to satisfy the exercise. The operative factor is the energy required to do the exercise. So if I'm using more carbohydrate and getting more oxygen, uh, sorry, getting more energy out of it, what should happen is that if I'm measuring VO2 in these two modes of exercise, the total oxygen should be lower with the treadmill exercise. If I'm using more carbohydrate, I can reach that total amount of energy required with less oxygen. That's a really interesting point, though. But we don't have that information to say definitively one way versus the other, which, um, if that happens, my interpretation would be the total oxygen used would be less if the only factors that you changed were um, using more carbohydrate than fat. That's a really interesting idea to explore. In practice, it's confounded by the fact that Hannah's, uh, Hannah's point, that you're using more um, postural muscles, you're swinging your arms back and forth, so the O2 cost would be higher because those muscles are now active as well, and they're adding to the uh, oxygen consumed on top of just the muscles that are doing the, uh, the locomotion, the, the leg muscles, the uh, glutes, hamstrings, etc. But largely, it's fighting against gravity, more postural muscles, more engaged postural muscles, we'll put it that way. Yeah, Rosanna. Would the type of muscle be factor in it? Remember, like type 1 versus type 2? Excellent idea. Absolutely. How would that work? Type 1 versus type 2. Okay, that's true. So on an individual basis, there might be inherent differences. We're not showing individuals, we're, we're showing averages here, but I agree, absolutely. Within these average bars with standard errors, there could be individual differences that don't follow the trend. But with running, you might be more likely to rely on or tap into what muscle fibers? Uh, yeah, two. So you always activate one first when, um, or sorry, what's kind of in size principle? Small muscles first, small fibers first, large muscles after. You activate type one first when those fatigue, type two come in to add more force. Or is the other way around? I forget now. No, I think, I think that's right. Yeah, and type 2 are inherently less efficient, which might add to the energy expended during exercise. That's a great idea. Yeah. Okay. Now let's see if we actually find this, if this is borne out in, uh, in lab this week. So this is what you should expect. You're essentially going to look at um, one half of this figure, and you'll have one bar, running versus walking, because you have one subject, you don't have a group, and there's no, no error bars, but... That's the division you're looking for. Now, I want to show, before we get into the physiology aspects, the clinical applications of diet and exercise. In keeping with showing the answer first, if I'm going to argue that we want to maximize the total cost of exercise, this is showing us what effect that has. What are the clinical applications of diet and exercise? And before this course had a lab component, it was largely research paper discussions. And so in a topic like this where we talked about the physiology of obesity and diabetes, we would then sit down as a group and discuss papers related to the topic. And so we don't do that as much now that we have the lab component, but I want to show you some of the papers that we have discussed in the past because they're directly applicable. This is exercise different types of exercise on body composition in dieting obese subjects, so our candidate population, the population that would, would need um, this type of intervention in question, and a comparison of what type of exercise might be best. 
we'll get into um, the ideas of intensity and then how this compares to diet coming up. But what type of exercise strength or aerobic might be best? It's hard to approximate the energy expenditure of strength training, just like it is with uh, HIIT training. But we're looking at the end goal. After the course of eight weeks, what happens to weight? So strength and diet, aerobic diet, diet only, we see changes in weight where everyone starts on the fairly heavy side, everyone loses weight, all groups lose weight. The strength group loses less weight overall than the aerobic and the diet groups, which immediately makes you think, well, why would you want to do strength exercise? A lot of the time body composition is the, um, or, or, or weight loss is the operative outcome that we're looking for but it's a change in body composition with strength exercise that prevents it from uh, decreasing as much as the other two groups. The strength group tends to retain more lean mass than the other two groups. Large decreases in weight across the board, more with aerobic and diet, less with strength, but that's because there's less of a decrease in lean mass. And lean mass is muscle mass, it's organ mass, bone mass, water mass, etc. Uh, but a greater preservation of that lean mass is generally desirable. We don't have the uh, metabolic rate information, but more lean mass will mean a higher resting metabolic rate and more energy expended. So taking that out of the equation, perhaps the more desirable trait is what happened to fat mass over time. And we see equal large reductions in fat mass over only eight weeks with strength, aerobic, or diet only deficits. Now this was pretty well controlled, all equal deficits. Everybody was in a 30% calorie deficit. Um, so there's the only difference is the type of deficit. Is it from exercise and diet or diet only? And what's really nice to see is that similar, um, even though we have similar fat loss, Fat-free mass is better preserved with strength and diet type exercise. So all types of energy deficit resulted in weight loss, um, but fat mass, uh, sorry, fat-free mass was largely preserved with strength training. We don't have any idea of the downstream effects, so insulin sensitivity. I'm not showing you the oxygen consumption data. Um, but what we care about here is body composition and affecting body composition. So both decrease fat mass, strength preserves lean mass. If we focus only on aerobic type training, there's always the dichotomy between high intensity interval versus long duration endurance. How do those compare in affecting uh, weight and here, insulin, fasting insulin, and young women. So it's a, different, um, it's a different population. They're not obese. This is a much longer study, over 15 weeks. And at first glance, very promising. Ideal scenario for the high-intensity interval group, the black bar pointing down, large decrease in fat mass, which is not seen in the other groups. The, uh, the control group, the steady-state group, neither experiences a decrease in fat mass. If anything, they increase slightly. So it's tempting to just take information like this and say, oh, well, interval training is the way to go. Young women, non-obese, weight training is the way to go, large decrease in fat mass. Um, part of the exercise of digging into studies like this is to figure out why the conclusions are correct and maybe more importantly why they're not correct. And so we dig into this study a little bit and we see um, some differences in the uh, anthropometric uh, data between these groups. The high intensity interval group, yes, lost a lot of fat, but also had much more to begin with. They were heavier overall had a larger percentage body fat to begin with, so it, it could speak to the fact that they might have been more susceptible to weight loss. Or maybe the endurance group was less susceptible because they had a lower fat mass in total. Either way, this is a difference between the groups that was unaccounted for in the study. 
So it's hard to say one is better than the other. Compound on that, the idea that the food intake is drastically different. The steady state group consistently ate way more than the interval group, which probably also contributed to the resistance in the steady state group to losing fat mass. Much more energy in, even though the exercise was matched for energy out. This large discrepancy in fat mass uh, changes over 15 weeks is probably due to some combination of these two factors. Less fat mass to lose and much higher energy intake over the course of the 15 weeks. So we can still draw some conclusions, but we can't really compare these modes, at least from this study alone. The results that they observed are obviously their results, right? They were observable. Fat mass did decrease a lot in this group. So at least for these individuals, high intensity interval training prompted a large loss in fat mass over 15 weeks. We can't say it's better or worse than the steady state group because we don't know if those populations were comparable. Can't say that steady state training was effective at all because fat mass didn't really change. But there is some evidence here that high intensity interval training can certainly bring about some decrease in fat mass, which in and of itself is a pretty interesting finding because this isn't the type of exercise that you would expect uses a lot of fat. You already addressed that. Higher RERs, more carbohydrate. Why would there be a decrease in fat mass doing high intensity interval training? And I'll leave that for you to mull over. What's encouraging is that even though many studies look over 8 to 12, 8 to 15 weeks, there is some suggestion that um, these lifestyle changes can persist over longer durations. This is over the course of a year with a lab group that has a lot of grant funding and a lot of manpower to be able to run studies like this, comparing directly exercise versus diet versus a healthy living control in their ability to change weight, insulin activity over the course of a year. So Calorie Group in Washington, John Holozzi is one of the, the pioneers of exercise physiology work. Um, lots of money in that lab. Comparing directly exercise, calorie restriction or, or dieting versus healthy lifestyle we see over the course of a year really nice decreases in weight. Really nice decreases in weight, both the exercise and the dieting group. So it seems that regardless of how you institute an energy deficit, 20% in this case, not 30 like the first study, but if you persist over the course of a year, we see some pretty large decreases in, uh, in weight over the course of that year. A functional measure to uh, accompany the weight change is shown here. ISI is uh, insulin sensitivity index. Higher the better, more insulin sensitive. We see a nice increase in insulin sensitivity in the exercise and the dieting group. Again, suggesting somewhat that no matter how you create an energy deficit, that you create the energy deficit is really the driving factor for uh, decreasing weight and improving insulin sensitivity. The difference, if you're uh, wondering, there seems to be a difference in weight here. It's uh, the exercise group tended to have a better preservation of lean mass. One more kilogram of lean mass, which would um, equalize those two numbers if you accounted for it. So over the course of a year, equal improvements in uh, weight change and insulin sensitivity with a modest 20% per day energy deficit. An energy deficit here is the operative uh, idea, the important idea. We are approaching it from the point of view of exercise and how do we increase intensity and duration of exercise to maximize that deficit. But this uh, acknowledges certainly that the nutrition aspect, the dietary aspect can have a large uh, effect as well and then Combining the two can have another more potent effect if we're able to do that.
So if we consider uh, exercise in the context of obesity and diabetes, both exercise and diet can induce weight loss as long as there's some deficit created. Weight loss occurs, glucose handling is improved. This happens in lean individuals and overweight individuals. It's a universal truth if we uh, create a deficit that these factors will be improved. For our purposes, exercise, but we also need to acknowledge that diet is the same. If we institute changes in either of these areas, the mechanism of action is really that they require you to use the surplus of energy that was stored. They require an input of energy that comes from the stored food energy in the body. What we'll look at next in the physiology section is if that surplus of stored food energy is connected to obesity and diabetes, then exercise and diet are potent therapeutic cures. Long term, exercise and dietary interventions are feasible. It's possible, maybe with the right incentives. Um, but nonetheless, it is possible to maintain these types of programs for um, at least a year. We've observed at least a year. And I'm sure there's anecdotal reports of longer. And there's certainly some uh, consideration that needs to be lent to exercise and diet being somewhat interchangeable, but exercise largely helps to uh, preserve lean mass. And in that realm of exercise, strength training seems to have a larger stimulatory effect on preserving fat-free mass, on uh, keeping muscle mass, and not losing that, uh, that important metabolic tissue. Exercise in general helps preserve lean mass. Strength training, if you had to pick uh, a type of exercise, largely will be um, a more important component. So I am going to call it there. We're going to move into the physiology of diabetes next class. I know we have some time left today, but I'm not going to get into this yet. We will go through these slides in detail, and then um, there's a few fun videos at the end. The extremes of applying these, uh, these principles to diet and obesity. We'll see those on Thursday. Any questions before we finish for the day? Yeah, Hannah? Um, from that very first study, the walk versus run, yeah. I was just wondering if the like differences decrease if you have like a more well-trained individual or like increase if you have like an obese person like on an individual level like if you put a runner doing that and they're really used to running so they're efficient versus someone who like never runs mm. so they're really inefficient with that gap like change size so the question <laughs> would be is there is it possible to find someone that is efficient at running and not at walking? Or the other way, are they efficient at walking and not they, efficient like, at running? Yeah, as just as efficient as running as they are at walking. So the idea of an obese person doing this would probably widen the gap. Yeah. It might not be as hard to walk versus the, the increased inefficiency of running. It might widen the two. Uh, as for a runner that is practiced at running, I think that practice would also translate into their ability to walk as well. So they would both similarly decrease. I don't think that the gap would close, if that's your question. But I think you can widen the gap by decreasing the efficiency of running. Absolutely. That's an opinion, though. I don't have data to back it up. Okay. Have a wonderful Tuesday. Thank you.